be seated. Why don't you take your Bibles and turn with me to Genesis chapter 28. Genesis chapter 28, we're going to t- talk about a message this morning entitled Wrestling Jacob. Genesis chapter 28. While you're turning over there, do y'all mind if I tell you a story that doesn't really have anything to do with anything? Y'all mind if I do that? Just kind of tell you a little bit about our Mother's Day last year. We uh, just moved here from Alabama and in the near the town where we live, uh, where the church was, Trustville. Um, there's uh, the Cahaba River kind of runs through there, and there's this beautiful bridge and this beautiful park, and it's just a really pristine area right in the middle of town. Well, Shannon, my wife, Every Mother's Day, all she wants is two things. One is some chicken from Kentucky Fried Chicken and for us to leave her alone. That's all she wants, right? Well, what a great Mother's Day. And so, you know, Morgan, our oldest daughter, she's the thoughtful one. She thinks of other people. She likes other people to to feel good. So she'll go out of her way to do anything she can to just make your day great. Well, Morgan wanted to add one little thing to the tradition. She said, Dad, what if we not only go get Mom, uh, uh, the chicken, but what if we leave church and go have a picnic with her down by the Cahaba River in the park in Trussell? And I'm like, hey, that sounds great. We'll do that, and then we'll send her home from there, and I'll take you guys, and we'll leave her alone, right? So we endeavor to do that. We go down and get our chicken right after church, and man, I want to tell you, the house was packed that morning. And uh, just full of people uh, at the church. And, and I'll just tell you straight up, I mean, I preached a killer sermon that day. It was awesome. <laughs> and uh, so all these people were there to hear it. And we were feeling good, you know, just energized. We got our chicken. We went down the river. We didn't even change our clothes. I mean, I'm wearing my white shirt, my suit pants, you know. And Shannon's in her dress. And she's just looking beautiful. And my little daughter Kylie's in her little white dress. And Morgan's looking beautiful. I mean, we're just the perfect little Baptist family sitting there eating the gospel bird on the side of the river, right? <laughs> so, so we got her spread out there. And, and, and just across the river, there's this road where people come into the park. And this guy pulls up in a truck. And when he opens the door of that truck, he had this dog that I don't think that dog had been out of the house in like eight years. Because it came, I mean, he opened the door and that dog's whew, right out of the cab of that truck and he's running. I mean, he's coming right at us. And dude takes a ball and just chunks it right in the river, where, right toward where we're sitting. And this dog's running toward the river, and he jumps off the bank of the river, and he's flying, splashing, and he's going, you know, and he grabs that ball. And he's coming right at us. Now, let me give you a little bit about my family. We are not pet people. We're, we're not animal people. I mean, there's like a parental lock on the animal channel on our TV, all right? We, we don't do animals. The only animal we have is a fish. And his name was Jonah, and he used to sit on my desk. And Shannon sent him on in last week. I mean, he died last week. So, so we are petless right now. now. I'm not bitter about that. But anyway... Um, God rest his soul. So anyway, but we're my terrified of dogs. She she's not just afraid. She's like shaking afraid, all right? Shannon doesn't care for dogs. Kylie's game for anything, all right? So here we are, and as this dog gets closer and closer, I can feel Morgan backing up. I can feel Shannon kind of rising up. And so I'm the I'm the dad. I'm I'm the protector of the family, right? And so I turn around to my family just so they can hear, and I said, listen, y'all, don't be afraid. If that dog comes up here, I'll kick it in the teeth. I mean, I just, <laughs> I just went ahead and told them honest, straight up, what I was going to do, right? Well, anyway, the dog, finally, he turns around, swims back. Guy takes the ball, throws it again right towards us. Here comes the dog. Ooh, same thing. You know, and I'm thinking, if that dog comes over here, he's going to shake and he's going to ruin my chicken, and he's going to mess up my little beautiful family who's sitting here minding our own business, right? And this keeps happening over and over and over. And I'm going to tell you something. I don't know what it is about you dog people, but y'all got to see a dog. I mean, you just get mesmerized by the dog. The crowd is gathering on the other side of the river. Watch, they just can't believe this dog can swim, you know? So there's lots of people over there, and we're here at this bridge, and, and, and I am trying to telepathically send this guy a man-on-man message. And he finally, you know, this, he finally catches my eye. And telepathically, I'm telling him, there are 13. 
1,400 miles that the Cahaba River goes through the state of Alabama. You need to move your dog on up the river or I'm going to do something about it, right? And without me saying anything, he, he's like, oh, hey, hey, sorry, sorry, I apologize, you know. And, and, and he said, I will move, you know, and there's all these people that are watching the whole scene. Well, anyway... After he finally agrees to move his dog, my daughter Kylie, Morgan is the thoughtful one. Kylie is the wild card sometimes. And she's got this voice that carries. And she stood up in front of all those people, probably half of them were at our church and just heard the sermon I preach. And she said, if your dog comes over here, my daddy's going to kick it in the teeth. <laughs> so, I promise you that happened one year ago today, all right? So... Anyway, that has nothing to do with the sermon. I just thought y'all needed to hear that story, all right? But we are in this thing of dirt, right? How families become dirty. And have you ever really thought about what it means when you hear this phrase, God saves sinners? Have you ever really thought about how dirty of a work that that really is. And, and Paul expresses in Philippians, we read it a minute ago, he says, I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. And he also says, this is why I'm suffering like I am. It's no cause for shame because I know whom I believe and I am convinced that he is able to keep that which I have committed to him against or until that day. Paul says, I know that God is committed to saving me. No matter where I've been through, no matter what I've come from, I know God's committed to this. And you've heard phrases like that. I know God's, uh, God's committed to save and all that kind of stuff. But let me ask you this question. How committed is God to saving us? Is there a level of dysfunction in our family at which God says, that's even too much for me. This, it, it, this is too much for me. I can't... I can't handle that. Is there a level of filth in our family or in our story? Is there a level of dirt at which God says, I am too great for that? You, you are too far below me. Exactly how committed is God to working through the dirtiness of our stories in order to bring salvation into our lives? The story of Jacob is an interesting story that we began last week. Now, we know that Jacob is a lying, cheating, scheming, scheming, deceiver guy. But this is the guy who becomes Israel, as we're going to see in this story this morning. And it is from Israel that the Messiah, Jesus Christ, is born. If you think your family's bad, wait till you hear the family Jesus comes from. And you'll see from this story that God is committed to saving us. And Jacob has heard this before. And Jacob says, hey listen God, uh, chapter 28 verse 15, God says, at the, the lowest time of Jacob's life, God says to him, I am with you, I will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I promised you. It's almost verbatim what Paul is saying. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. God is saying, Jacob, I will finish what I started in you. I'm committed to this. And Jacob responds like all dirty people like us would. And he uses the word if. Verse 20 of chapter 28. If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread and eat clothing to wear so that I come again to this place, my father's house, in peace. He says, if God will feed me, clothe me, help me, and bring me back here, comma, then the Lord will be my God. It's almost like Jacob says, okay, I have heard you're committed to me. Now let's see how committed you are. Because Jacob says, if you'll be with me on this journey, and I want to tell you, this journey is quite a mouthful. Because these episodes begin to unravel in Jacob's life, and we find out how dirty this man really is. Chapter 29. Chapter 29, Jacob is running away from his, father, his, his brother Esau, and he goes to this place where the Bible says in verse 2 of chapter 29, "...the stone on the well's mouth was large." 
And so there's these guys and they're shepherds and they're watering their flock. Jacob shows up. They say, hey, what's going on? Well, Laban, our master, his daughter, Rachel, is about to come out here and water the flock. He's like, all right. So all of a sudden, Rachel starts coming. And I know that uh, last week we talked about Jacob. A lot of preachers say Jacob's this effeminate Martha Stewart kind of a... A soft guy. That's not what the Hebrew says. It says Jacob is smooth, but Jacob is a man's man. Because when he sees Rachel coming, the Bible says that he rolled by himself the stone off the well, right? He said, and that's what a pretty girl will do to you. You see her coming, you're like, hey, he man, and he moves that thing away. And he sees Rachel and asks who she is. And I want you to look at verse 11. Jacob kissed Rachel, wept aloud, and Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's kinsman and that he was Rebekah's son, and she ran and told her father. Now, if you were with us a couple of weeks ago about when Isaac met Rebekah, I would venture to say this is probably the same well, and if it's not the same well, it's, it's the same almost verbatim scenario of how Isaac's servant met Rebecca, the wife of Isaac. This is showing us, have you ever had one of those moments in life when it was just like all the stars came together and you could just tell God was in it and brought you to the right place at the right time? Jacob is at the right place at the right time. And you can just tell God is all over this. And so Jacob goes to Laban. So God is with him and Jacob goes to Laban, his, uh, his uncle. And he says, he's marrying his first cousin, which is kind of weird. But anyway, so he goes and says, what have I got to do to marry this girl? And he says, I'll tell you what you need to do. He says, you need to work seven years. And he says, no problem. The Bible says he loved Rachel so much, seven years went by like it was a few days. He gets the end of seven years and he goes to marry Rachel and they have a big beautiful wedding and all this kind of stuff. And dude, I'm going to tell you, I don't know what he drank that night. I don't know what he did that night. And I don't know how dark it was that night. But the Bible says when he woke up in the morning, he wasn't married to Rachel. He was married to Leah, her older sister. Now, the Bible has a real tactful way of describing Leah and that it gives us a word that says her eyes were weak. Okay? If you look that up in the original language, the literal translation is this. She was as ugly as a dog. All right? <laughs> That's what it's saying. This is an ugly girl. So he goes, he thinks he's going to, to, to bed first night with his beautiful wife, and he wakes up with an ugly one. Laban has deceived the deceiver. And Laban says in verse 26, Laban said, It is not done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. And why is Jacob running? Because he has deceived his older brother out of the birthright. And it's almost like God says, I'm with you, but I also want to show you something else, that you reap what you sow. And so he reaps what he sows, and when he hears this, you know it's got to be a punch in the gut, because he knows that what he has done is chasing after him. And so Laban has deceived successfully the deceiver. He works seven more years. He finally gets Rachel. Episode number two begins in verse 31. The Lord saw that Leah was hated, and he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. And Leah conceived and bore a son and called his name Reuben. For she said, because the Lord has looked upon my affliction, for now my husband will love me. Now, you got to understand what's going on here. This, this baby is born... And when the baby is born, they say something. We have the English translation of what they say. But if you look it up in the Hebrew, it sounds like Reuben. So every time a child is born, you can read this for several paragraphs down through there. The child is born, the sister will say something. And whatever they say, the way that word sounds, it becomes his name. Issachar, Zebulun, Naphtali. All right, that's how they get those names. If you don't understand what's going on here, there's a real subtle interplay in that Leah hates Rachel, and Rachel hates Leah. And every time they, they have a child, they name the child in such a way that it digs at the other sister. Right? It's almost like Rachel has a child and she names him, Yo, hips are big. Right? <laughs> so every time you hear that name, the rest of it is like, Hey, yo, hips are big. It's time for you to take out the trash. It's digging at the sister. That, and I know that's hilarious, but that's exactly what's going on here. Now, what's incredible about this 
is this is the blessings of God upon this family. First thing God blessed him with said, be fruitful and multiply in Genesis, right? So they're being fruitful and multiplying. But that rivalry in the family is so diminishing the work of God in their lives. And I don't know what's going on in your family. You may come up in a family like Laban's family where there's a lot of deceit. There's a lot of lying. There's a lot of untruth. And listen, it's hard to come up in a family you can't trust. Amen. And it's hard to come up in a family where there's a lot of rivalry and and tension, and just fighting all the time. And if I said, hey, raise your hand if you came up with a family like that, I'd say, Ben, say a lot of people will raise their hand and say, yeah, there's a lot of tension in my family. And you know what? When you come up in a family, there's a lot of mistrust and tension and rivalry. God and His blessings are the furthest thing from your mind. Amen. And when you come up in a family like that, and you hear these words, God is committed to saving you, if you can't trust your family... You hear those words and you look at God and say, can I believe you in that too? If you've never really had any, any reason to trust anybody, the closest people to you, it's hard to trust God. But hey, listen, even though we come up in families like this, God is still with Jacob. He is committed to saving him. And so we go to the next episode. We, we see uh, 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 Jacob wrestle with Laban. We see the sisters wrestle with one another. And then we see again, chapter 30, verse 25, that Jacob begins to wrestle with his father-in-law again. As soon as Rachel had born Joseph, Jacob said to Laban, that's the 11th child. Send me away that I may go to my own home country. Give me my wives and my children. I know I've served you. I may go for I know the service that I've given you. In other words, I have fulfilled the contract. We're leaving. But Laban says, now check this out, verse 27. If I have found favor in your sight, I have learned by divination. <laughs> so he's like playing the Ouija board in the house. What, what kind of father-in-law is this, right? That the Lord has blessed me because of you. Now, what's about to happen is real interesting because Laban says, I tell you what, if you want to go, you're, you're a real blessing to my home, first of all. I don't like you very much and we, we fight a lot, but... And hey, listen, I don't know what kind of person you work for. They may be the world's greatest jerk. They may be somebody that is, div uh, is into divination. They may be somebody that, that you can't trust. That They may be into all kinds of crazy things. And, and, and it, you find it very, very hard to work for this person. But even if you find it very, very hard to work for this person, listen, if you are a follower of Christ, your presence in that business ought to be a blessing to everyone around you. Even if you work for Laban, Laban ought to be able to look at your life and say, I can tell you're a child of God. And you are a blessing to our business. That you are a good hire for us. And that's what Laban is saying to Jacob. You are a good hire to us. You bring blessings to us. So Laban says, I'll let you go. But what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to give you like all the, the, the flock that's speckled. Or he turns it around and he says, now I'm going to give you all the, the flock that's plain. And what he's doing is, is he's trying to deceive Jacob again. But what the Bible says Jacob does in verse 37, Jacob took fresh sticks of poplar and almond and plane trees, peeled white streaks in them, exposing the white of the sticks. And if Laban says, you'll take all the spotted ones, he changes the sticks and all the... The flock is spotted, and so he just cleans Laban out. So Laban changes the rules, and he says, No, 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 man, we're going to take all the planes. And you know what Jacob does? He just changes the sticks again. Now, you read that passage, and you go, Huh? <laughs> What's this deal with the sticks? The sticks are really irrelevant, because look at verse 9 of chapter 31. Jacob goes into the field. He talks to his wives, and he says, God has taken away the livestock of your father and given them to me. Basically, Jacob says, the sticks were cool, but we know who's really behind this. God is with me. Amen. This guy is a liar, a cheat, and a thief, but yet God made a promise that he would save him, and God is still working to bring this guy back to Bethel. This is amazing. So you know what Jacob does? He cleans Laban out. 
He takes his wives and his servants and they, they take off three days and Laban catches them. Now the Bible tells us, if you look down about, um, about verse 17, down to verse 19, Rachel stole her father's household gods. Now remember this. Because that word stole is the word Jacob. Jacob. She has taken the household gods. So she has, if you read it literally, it almost reads like this. Rachel has, has become like Jacob. Now Laban catches them and he says, hey, where are you going? And, and, and uh, Jacob says, I need you to leave us alone. He says, well, one more thing. Somebody has stolen my gods. And Jacob gets irate. Verse 32 of chapter 31. Anyone with whom you find your God shall not live in the presence of our kinsmen. Point out what I have that is yours and take it. Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen them. Or literally, he did not know that Rachel had become like him. That's what it says. Have you ever seen someone who sounds like... who sounds foolish... Because they are trying to sell to everyone else around them somebody that we all know they're not. You ever met somebody like that? It's called a hypocrite. <laughs> and when you are convinced that your family is not like you, and you stand up in front of the lost world and you say, Hey, not us, not us, we're not like that. That's called a hypocrite. And in Jacob's hypocritical moment, he makes a very rash oath. The one you find the gods with, they're going to die. Mark that, because it's going to come up in just a few minutes. Laban goes around and he begins to fill around and look for the household gods. And the Bible says that when he comes up to Rachel, she's got the gods under her seat on the camel. And she lies to her father and she says, I am in the way of women. She says, I don't understand what that means. Let's talk after church. I'll explain it to you, all right? <laughs> And she says, I can't get up. And so she tricks her father and she lies. And she is just like Jacob. She has carried out the deceit. You know, there's a lot of people who will say these words. I'm not going to go to church because it's full of hypocrites. It doesn't take a brilliant person to figure out that that's true. Just because you figured out that the church is full of hypocrites doesn't make you smarter than everybody else. <laughs> We all knew that. <laughs> That's who we are. You know, the worst thing about us is a lot of times we deceive ourselves into thinking we're somebody that we're not. Amen. And whenever we, we deceive ourselves into thinking we're somebody that we're not, we make these rash oaths that later on will cost us. But you know what the good news is? You may not be committed to coming to church before, because it's full of hypocrites, but the good news is our God is committed to saving even the hypocrite. Amen. Because God is still with Jacob. And so we go on to the next episode, chapter 32, in which Jacob, hey listen, if you're going in your life and you say, man, I've done wrong and I need to make a turn, when you make a turn, you're going to be staring your worst mistakes right in the face. And that's why a lot of people never change, because they know if they change, they have to confront their former self. And Jacob turns around and guess who he sees? Esau. Esau's the very reason he began to run in the first place. Because he deceived him and he scared him. He's going to get killed by him. So Jacob does a very manly thing. In that he takes his family and divides them in three parts. And he says, you guys go take these gifts and y'all stand right up here. And y'all go meet Esau and see what he says. And then you guys take these gifts. And if he kills all of them, then you guys go to him and see what he says. And then he takes the third, he says, and you guys go right here and you take all these gifts and y'all see what he says. And Jacob says, and I'll be right here. <laughs> now that's a man's man, isn't it? And Jacob literally says, if he slaughters all my family, at least I'll know what Esau's up to and I can get away. Now there's another, another subtle thing going on here. In that Jacob calls Esau Lord over and over and over and gives him these gifts. Now... What's going on here is if it all goes according to Jacob's plan, he has given the blessing that he deceived Esau for back to him. Everything he took, he is returning. He is trying to give back to Esau what God is so desperately trying to give to him. And if you would really be honest about things going on in your life, you would probably figure out very, very quickly that you're trying to give away 
all the things that God is trying to give you. And so at that moment when Jacob is alone and he is standing back there contemplating what might happen the next day, I'm about to tell you God does something that you're like, I, I, wait a minute, did you just say what you just said? Listen, God attacked him. In the dark, in the middle of the night, God jumped on Jacob. You say, I didn't know God jumped on anybody. He sure does. The same night, verse 22, he arose, this is chapter 32, and took his two wives, his two female servants, his eleven children, and he crossed the ford at Jabbok. That word Jabbok means wrestling, and it sounds like Jacob. He took everything and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had. And Jacob, which sounds like the word wrestling, was left alone, and a man Jabbok or wrestled with him over and over. Wrestle, wrestle, wrestle. And that, sometimes that's the way you feel like life is. It's just wrestling. And you can't get anything to turn out right. And so this man wrestles him all night long. In verse 25 it says, When he sees he cannot prevail against Jacob, he touches hip socket. And Jacob's hip was, put, hip was put out of his joint and he wrestled with him. Then he said, Let me go for the day is broken. But Jacob said, Now remember how Jacob came out of the womb? He was holding Esau's heel. He is the deceiver, the one who grabs from behind. So the picture is, the, the wrestler is saying, let me go, I've got to leave, and Jacob has him right here. And he says, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? The last time somebody asked Jacob, what is your name, was his father. What did Jacob say? He said, my name is Esau. He said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then load to verse 30. Jacob says, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been delivered. Three things happen right here. The first one is this. Jacob has to do the most difficult thing for any of us to do, and that is to be honest about who we really are. What is your name? <laughs> that question is, who are you really? Who are you really? And he says, when he says, Jacob, he says, I'm a liar. I know who I am. The other thing he does is he says, I'm not going to let you go till you bless me. Remember what Jacob has done? He has tried to wrestle the blessing away from Isaac, his father. He's tried to wrestle the blessing away from his brother Esau. He's tried to wrestle the blessing away from Laban. And for the first time in his life, he realizes the real blessing is found in only one, and that is God. Amen. And the other thing he has done is this. If you look back to the previous story in verse, th verses 9 down to verse 12, Jacob prays and asks God, God, please deliver me from Esau. And God has to go to Jacob and say, I promise you, I'm going to take care of you. And he reaffirms his promises. And Jacob realizes all of his life he's been trying to get deliverance and blessing. But he realizes not only does the blessing found in only one in God, but he also realizes that deliverance is found in only one, and that is God. So where are we? God says, I'm going to change your name, Jacob, because you have striven with men and with God. I don't know what's going on in your life, and I don't know what your background or your story is, but I would venture to say throughout your story, you've had to wrestle with a lot of things and a lot of people. But ultimately, our wrestling is not just with people, but ultimately our wrestling is with God. We do drugs, we do alcohol, we do men, we do women, we do whatever we've got to do to find peace and blessing and prosperity in our lives. And we're never satisfied. We do money, we do wealth, we do cars, we do whatever we got to do. And there's no blessing in it. And it's just a wrestling. And then we want to be better. We want to be delivered. We want to be safe. And we can't find deliverance, anything that will bring peace into our lives. And so we wrestle. And it's only until the point that we can be honest with ourselves and say, here's who I really am. And I know that blessing and deliverance are only found in God. 
That is when we begin to find salvation. So God goes, Jacob comes to Esau and he meets him. And you know what Esau does? Esau doesn't kill anybody. He hugs his brother, kisses him and says, Man, I don't need your stuff. And he has a, cha a change of heart. Amen. Now I don't know what's going on in your family. And I don't have time to get into all this kind of stuff. But it is overshadowing what the gospel can do in your life. And all you can think of is the wrestling and the tension that you're in all day long. Let me tell you this, I have seen it with my own eyes in family after family after family. If you are trying to change the hearts of people, all you're going to do is wrestle. Amen. There is only one who can change the human heart, and that is God. Amen. And that's what God has done for Esau. He's changed his heart. And so after he meets Esau, actually Jacob deceives him again and says, Yeah, bro, I'm going to go with you to this country. And after Esau gets out of sight, he goes, Okay. And he heads off another way. Now, chapter, the, the next chapter in the story, chapter 34, it, there's several times in the book of Genesis where Genesis says, let me tell you this story about these people, but let me throw another chapter in here just to show you how bad it's gotten in their lives. And chapter 34 is that story of just how bad it's gotten. Let me tell you this story very, very quickly. Dinah is the barely mentioned sister of the 11 boys that have already been born. She is the daughter of Leah. Now, they settle in this place. It's Hivite country. The Bible says Dinah goes out and she wants to see the other women. And while she's out there, Shechem, who's a prince in, in the Hivite territory, sees her, the Bible says, lays with her and defiles her, humiliates her. Verse 5, Jacob heard that he had defiled his daughter Dinah, but his sons were... And it says, period, but his sons. What does Jacob do or feel about the defilement of his daughter? It's silent. It's almost like Jacob's like, eh, what happens, happens. But his brothers are mad. And, and, and his brothers are so angry because if you look at the very last verse... After something really bad happens, Jacob is indignant with his sons, and the sons throw it back in the father's face, and they say this, Should he treat our sister like a prostitute? End of the chapter. Man, you talk about strife in a family. I mean, this is tense. What they're saying is this. Over and over in this chapter, the author will tell you, this Shechem loved Dinah. But when you get physical acts above Real commitment, you defile the other person and treat them like a prostitute. I don't care how much you love a person until you're really ready to commit to them in marriage. You are getting the cart before the horse and you defile one another. That's what's going on in this chapter. Marriage is a sacred thing. And these brothers are mad. And so the, the Hivites come and Shechem says, and the father of Shechem says, Hey, we want to trade sheep and women and the whole bit with you. And you know what the Bible says that these boys do? The, the boys begin to answer and the Bible says deceitfully. You know what that word is? Jacob. They're just like their daddy. They're schemers. And they say this. Now this is mind-blowing. They say, I tell you what, we'll trade horses, sheep, women, camels, whatever. But you guys have got to circumcise yourself. <laughs> now, I don't know how much Shechem loved Dinah, and I don't know what else is going on there, but there must have been a whole lot of affection there because he goes to city gates, tells all the other guys, and they're like, all right, <laughs> what? <laughs> That's a pretty steep price to pay. But you know what? This rite of circumcision is what God gave to Abraham to show to the whole world that we are bringing a blessing to the nations. So they circumcise themselves, think they're entering into the covenant of blessing. And I would venture to say the medical equipment back then is probably not as keen as it is right now. <laughs> so three days later, when the fullness of soreness has set in, and you know how surgery, that first day is bad, but a couple days after that is real bad. And there's probably a lot of infection that's there. Simeon and Levi and probably the rest of the brothers attack and they slaughter all in. They not only slaughter the men, but the Bible says, verse 28, 
of chapter 34, they took the flocks, the herds, the donkeys, whatever was in the city and the field, all the wealth, their little ones, their wives, all that was in the city they captured and plundered. So you know what they did? They took the sign of the covenant and the blessing and they turned it into murder. They have no regard for the covenant of God and they will use it deceitfully to get their way. And you know what? how bad it is in Jacob's family? Jacob's sons have done to the Hivite men what Jacob was afraid Esau would do to him. These boys and this daddy is bad. So here's the question. How, how committed is God to saving us? After you've had 11 kids of 12 wives, after you've gone through a rape, after you've stolen, after you've been tension in your family, sibling rivalry, deceit, murder, lust, greed. You say, dude, I thought my family was bad. Hey, listen to me. Jesus' family is real bad. This is the line of Israel. Jacob. And so, chapter 35. What do you do when you look at your family and you look at your life and you say, it's a mess, but I have heard that God will save. And finally Jacob gets it because God comes to him and expresses his commitment to him again. Arise, go to Bethel and dwell there. Make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. Remember what you heard from me at the worst time of your life. I will save. And whenever you finally settle in your heart that salvation is truly found in God, what's the only right way to respond to this? The Bible says, Jacob, verse 2, said to his household and to all who are with him, put away the foreign gods that are among you and purify yourselves and change your garments. Jacob says, God, I realize you're a God who says, we're going to change our clothes. God, I realize you're a God who says, we're going to put away our foreign idols. You know what that's called in the New Testament? That's called repentance and faith. Amen. The only right way to respond to a God who will save you is repentance and faith. Amen. That's it. I repent of my sin. I receive your gift of salvation. And Jacob affirms the vow. God affirms the name and changes Jacob's name from deceiver to Israel. The change of a name means everything. And we leave one last episode and this is this. Have you ever come to a point in time in your life and you've seen people make commitments to God or maybe you've made a commitment to God and you say, man, this feels good. I'm going to do this for God now. But you turn around on Monday and you go right back to your deception. And nothing ever really changes. And we have these great moments with God. We look at ourselves and we look at other people and go, will they really ever change? So we ask this question, will Jacob change? So after this change of the name... Verse 16, they journeyed from Bethel. When they were still some distance, the Bible says Rachel went into labor and she had a hard labor. And her labor, her labor was at its hardest. The midwife said to her, Do not fear, you'll have another son. And as her soul was departing, for she was dying, she called his name Benoni. Benoni means son of my sorrow, son of my bitterness. Remember what Jacob said at his hypocritical moment? Whoever takes the household gods is going to die. And Rachel thinks the curse is still on her. I think that's what's happening. And she names this child after the curse. Now it's one thing to, to, to say, I believe in God and I'm going to go a new way. And it's another thing to go right back on Monday to cursing. But has Jacob changed? The Bible says the, the, the mother called his name Benoni, but his father called him Benjamin, son of my strength, son of the blessing, son of a new day in my life. You know what, what Jacob signified when he said that I'm going to change this child's name? He's signifying to the world, things have changed. God is committed to me, and I am and committed to His blessing in my life. 
So I don't know what you've been going through and I don't know how much dysfunction there is or deceit or lying or theft or murder or drug abuse. I don't know how much dirt is in your story. But I bet you it would be hard to top that one. And the most dysfunctional moment in all of human history is when the righteous Son of God died on a sinner's cross for us. He did this. This is his family. He did this for one reason and one reason alone. Because the Father is committed to saving the filthy. You say, Pastor, how do I respond to that? It's real simple. Repentance and faith. That's the only way. Repentance and faith. You don't throw this if-then up before God. If you will, then I will. No, 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 no. God is committed to saving us. We respond by repentance and faith in Him. Would you bow your head and close your eyes with me for a moment? And if you're here this morning and you say, Pastor, I need salvation in my life. I am ready for a name change. I'm ready for a destiny change. I need Jesus. Would you come and let's take the Word of God and show you how to be saved? If you have questions, you have prayer requests, you want to join Liberty Baptist Church, if God's leading you toward baptism, if you need prayer about other things, this, this is the time we open our Bethel, our altar, and set it up before God and say, God, we know you hear us. And you are committed to us. And Lord, I'm coming to you in repentance and faith in this moment. So let me pray for you and then let's stand together and let's do what God's telling us to do. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for this day. Thank you for your people. And Lord, I pray that you would give us repentance and faith in this moment. That many people would be born again. We ask these things in Jesus' name.